the absolutely massive RPG Baldur's Gate 3 is out really soon. So let's gather up all the information available, everything you need to know about this game before it drops. We got 10 things, so let's get started off with number 10. Uh, Baldur's Gate 3 is a game that's actually been in early access for a while now. Almost three years, in fact. I remember us covering it way back when it first dropped in early access, and yeah, we liked it then, so there's that. And there's a lot of game here, and people have been playing it. So one of the big questions surrounding the game's final release date is if your early access character will actually carry over into that final game. I mean, that's not an unreasonable question. There are a lot of early access titles that seamlessly transition into 1.0 without any issues, but it looks like things are complicated and very complex with Baldur's Gate 3 because it won't be one of them. This comes straight from the developers. In the final game, you'll have to start over from the beginning. Early access saves do not carry over. So if you're getting really excited about this game, you see this video and you're thinking about jumping into early access right before just to get a head start, don't do that because it won't work when the final game drops. So just kind of a PSA for you. Next over at number 9, let's get into the details a little bit. This game is meant to be the ultimate Dungeons & Dragons sandbox. It's not just a top-down role-playing game or a CRPG, it also strives to accurately replicate the Dungeons & Dragons experience, and a big part of that is how it adapts 5th edition rules. This is all to say that, no, the game won't be like Larian's previous RPG, Divinity Original Sin 2. And if you're a longtime PC RPG player who spent a lot of time with the original Baldur's Gate games, then it's not like those games either. The originals were based on advanced Dungeons & Dragons, so this game is going to feel quite different. It's also a turn-based game, rather than real-time with pause like the original Baldur's Gate games. Now, one interesting aspect of the game is that it doesn't just directly translate the rules to a different format. The devs did make a few changes here and there to better translate the tabletop game to this unique medium. For one thing, uh, the, every weapon has a few different special actions associated with it, which gives melee fighters way more utility than they normally would have. Also, everyone has access to a few bonus actions that normally would be limited to certain classes in the tabletop game, you know, stuff like shove, jump, dip where you coat your weapon with some kind of damaging substance or hide. There's still the usual array of class specific actions and an entire spell casting system that may take some getting used to if you're expecting the usual magic points systems of most RPGs. Instead, there's a spell slot system uh, where you can only cast so many spells in each slot depending on the spell's level. Basically, weaker spells uh, you can cast more often. Stronger spells have a more limited section of slots and once they're depleted, the only way to cast them again is to take a, and I quote, long rest. One interesting wrinkle to this system is the upscaling ability, where you can cast lower level spells using a higher level spell slot, which can make certain spells more powerful. So uh, to make a long story short, there's a lot of stuff you can do in this game. The amount of depth in the combat alone seems staggering, at least from the sound of things. Now, next over at number 8, in most RPGs, there's not a lot left to random chance, but in Baldur's Gate 3, the roll of the dice is a huge part of the gameplay. Uh, it makes sense. Understanding how dice rolls work in the game is key to understanding how to do well in combat. It can be complicated, but if you intend to play this game seriously, then it's not a bad ass to take a minute and look at the fan wiki to get at least a cursory understanding on how things like attack rolls and critical hits and misses work. One new feature in 5th edition D&D that plays a big part in dice rolls is advantages and disadvantages. In the tabletop game, these roll modifiers are more up to the DM's discretion, of course, you know, a reward for role playing or an extra layer of challenge for a group of players that are doing a bit too well, but Larry and the developers have made this rule more systemic. Now, if you've got the high ground or, you know, you're attacking enemies that are bound or frozen or attacking from stealth, you know, stuff like that, you get this thing called advantage, which makes it so instead of rolling a single die, it rolls two and then takes the best option as your number. Disadvantages work the same way, but opposite. If you're attacked while disadvantaged, then it'll roll two dice and pick the worst option instead, which can be very bad. Unlike Divinity 2, which was much more restrained, there's a lot more full-blown randomness in Baldur's Gate 3. Of course, it's not like calculations are just all over the place. 
most attacks and defensive rolls depend on not just the random roll, but the ability score plus whatever proficiency bonus you've got, which does a lot more to skew things in your favor. So dealing with dice rolls might seem kind of intimidating at first, but it evens out in the end and shouldn't make things too frustrating. At least with the karmic dice setting turned on, which is on by default, which helps you if you start getting a lot of bad rolls in a row. That sounds good, but it works both ways. Enemies also get a hand from the system, so it overall makes combat faster and deadlier, at least in theory. Nobody knows exactly how the algorithm really works yet, but we know some people are gonna figure it out. I mean, the fact that we're talking this in depth, people are already probably gonna be on it. Next over at number seven, uh, one of our favorite innovations that Larian brought to the CRPG scene was that you could choose to play as any member of your party and make their story your own. It wasn't just like a cool way to flesh out party members, it also it made it a lot easier to just jump into the game without having to deal with the overwhelming amount of options available in the character creator. For a long time, it seemed like Baldur's Gate 3 wouldn't go in this direction, and would go back into the old blank slate style custom character stuff from the original games, but nope, they brought back Origins, and they might be even better this time. You can play as any of the six initial starting characters, and like Divinity, you can customize them as much as you want. The only thing set in stone is their race and their backstory, which is experienced differently when you play as them versus when they're a party member, which is cool. There's also some non-origin party members you can get with a few returning characters from the original games and a few more new ones. And these are companions that you cannot choose to play as in character creation. And along with the six normal origins, there's also the seventh special origin called the Dark Urge, which is only available to you as the player character. They are not recruitable. If you choose this character, it drastically alters your game and turns you into what amounts to a serial killer. You'll wake up at night with a dead body beside you with no memory of how they got there and you get special prompts to kill your own party members and often it locks you into certain choices where you literally have no control of your own actions and the urge takes over. It's a really totally different way to play the game, but it's not something the developers recommend for the first playthrough, obviously, unless you're a sicko. In fact, the developers have recommended that a custom character is the best way to play a first time game. The origins are better for replays and add that replay value, I guess. Of course, I mean, you do what you want. You're the player, you're the customer, but if you want to role play however you want, then a custom character is probably gonna be your best choice, long story short. Next over at number six, uh, like Larian's previous games, Baldur's Gate 3 doesn't necessarily have to be a solitary experience. You can play through the entire campaign with a buddy if you choose, and the experience should technically be seamless. You're not tethered together. Everyone can roam freely if they want, even if you do have to group up again together to rest. Progress is set by the host, and uh, only one player can be in conversation with an NPC at a time. You don't have to play with your friends if you don't want to. It's possible to just jump in with random strangers if you want. That might not be the best idea, however, because loot uh, works the same way here as it did in Divinity. It's pure finders keepers, and loot is party-based. So if you want something, you better hope the people playing with you have your best interests at heart and are willing to share, because otherwise you're totally out of luck. Uh, they're not even limiting multiplayer to online only, even if you think that will be a requirement for a game as complex as this, but they're actually going to let you play it split screen on both PC and console. It's a hell of a commitment to play a game this massive with a few people on the couch, but if you're up for it, the game gives you a lot of different options how to play with friends wherever they are. How well it'll actually work on day one though, that's another story. Early access had, had some problems, so keep your eyes peeled for that. Next over at number five, uh, Larian is changing the multi-classing rules to ignore ability score prerequisites. A guide with multi-classing rules as they may apply to BG3, common sources of confusion, and popular tabletop multi-class builds can be found here. Uh, one of the most intriguing features of Dungeons & Dragons is multi-classing, where you can select a second class when leveling up and obtain many class benefits. There are pitfalls to this, of course. You know, selecting a class that doesn't synergize well with your starting class can make multi-classing feel like you wasted a level, but in 5th edition, the mechanic is all around more forgiving. There's a lot of classes in Baldur's Gate 3, almost an overwhelming amount, but in general, the class combos that work well in 5th edition 
should also work well in the game. While multi-classing isn't in the early access version of the game, it will be an option in the final release, along with some noteworthy changes to the system. The two big adjustments made by the developers is that there's no longer an ability score requirement for certain multi-classes. So you don't need certain stats anymore, making it so you can multi-class into whatever you like. The other noteworthy change is how spell slots work. They've made it less punishing to put points into mage classes, so you're not getting only the weakest spells compared to if you were leveling up your main magic class. How exactly this works is unclear right now, but it sounds like they want to encourage magicians to more freely experiment without as many debilitating downsides as in a standard game of D&D. Now, next over at number four, this may be a little bit spoilery, but it's introduced at the start of the game and it's a major new game mechanic, so it is worth talking about. At the start of Baldur's Gate 3, your character gets a Mind Flare tadpole in their brain. Now, listen, if you're not up on D&D lore, a Mind Flare is a squid-faced race of psychic monsters who love to eat brains and reproduce by infecting other races with a tadpole, which, when left unchecked, will eventually transform the victim into a completely new Mind Flare. These guys are awesome. That, that's the predicament, though, that your character starts out with. You got this thing stuck in your brain, and getting rid of it is is the primary motivating factor for a good chunk of early access. And while the tadpole is in your brain, it's a corrupting presence. And uh, giving into its control will grant you these new illithid powers and special mind flare dialogue options. In the early access, these powers are granted based on class, but in the final game, they'll be much more involved with a full skill tree associated with them. The whole point of the story is that your characters want these things out as quickly as possible, and they'll eventually transform you into a monster. So giving into the temptation to use the abilities they grant you seems like a dangerous but cool choice. In early access, using these powers had no negative effects on you or the story, but we like to think that abusing this power will eventually come back to bite you in the ass, hard. In the final game, the developers can be pretty unforgiving with this stuff probably, so while they haven't said exactly what will happen if you overdo it with these powers, I wouldn't expect the best. But hey, it's up to you to figure that out. Next over at number three, for a series of games called Baldur's Gate, it's kind of surprising how little time you actually spend in the titular city. In all the pre-release footage, it seems like the city would be under siege and in ruins for the entire game, but with the recent trailer that they put out, it looks like this game will actually have the biggest version of the city yet. It seems like it's going to be one of the biggest locations ever seen in a CRPG, and all set on a single connected map rather than split into two parts or multiple parts like most RPGs of this type tend to do. According to the developers, the city was never originally meant to be this big, but as the game got more and more ambitious, the final city ended up being significantly bigger than they originally planned. We're talking like three or four times the original size, and we're looking forward to seeing how it all pans out. Now, down at number two, if you've played Divinity 2, then uh, you know how long a Larian developed RPG can be. And it sounds like this game will go even further than that. In an interview with IGN, they said that the game would be between 75 to 100 hours, and that's a normal playthrough. Apparently, if you're more of a completionist, it'll take around 200 hours. With any other developer, uh, we would call that an exaggeration, but if their other games are anything to go on, then it's probably a pretty safe estimate. There's a reason why they're releasing this game a month early so it's not competing with Starfield, and even a month almost feels like it's not enough time for this one, even just from what we've seen. Clearly the game is going to be massive because just look at the early access. It, it only covers a single chapter. There's a ton of it, and apparently with the final release, it's going to get a significant overhaul with a lot of new quests and features in there. And that's just playthrough one. And this game is a game that encourages you to play it again to see how things play out differently. I think it's safe to say that there's going to be a lot of game in here, so hopefully you're getting your money's worth. Now, down at number one, uh, like we said above, the game's original release date of September 6th has been pushed forward a month to August 3rd on PC, with the express reason given that Larian doesn't want to compete with Starfield. It's a godsend for players chomping at the bit to play this one on PC, either through Steam or GOG, but if you're on console, you're gonna have to wait. The game is also coming to PS5, but it's been delayed to September 6th. Xbox players will have to wait even longer, as there's still no release date for that version at this time. Apparently, they said there's a problem with the split-screen co-op on the Xbox Series S, so they're working with Microsoft to fix that issue. Until that's resolved, however, 
there's no release date. And for PS5 players, uh, if you get the deluxe edition upgrade, all that stuff, you can start playing the game 72 hours early. Unlike early access players on PC, anyone who plays the game early on this period on console gets to keep their saves. Now, to make things even more confusing, PC players do not get a head start. It comes out for everyone on PC at the same time. Uh, to make up for that, Larian is offering a free upgrade to the Digital Deluxe Edition with all pre-orders of the game. So basically, PC players get no head start, but free Deluxe. PS5 players get three days early access, but they gotta pay for it. It's not the most straightforward rollout by any means, but the important thing is to remember here is that uh, the game's coming out on Steam and GOG on August 3rd and September 6th on PS5 and Xbox eventually, so plan accordingly. We really hope they nail it with this one. We hope it's good. As of right now though, we haven't had our hands on the final game. We're going to be able to judge that for ourselves with a before you buy video, but hey, this was 10 things you need to know, so let us know in the comments what you think about Baldur's Gate 3. There's a lot with this one. It's, it's pretty heavy stuff. So let us know what you're looking forward to the most, your experience with early access, anything Baldur's Gate 3 at all, let us know. And if you like what we do here, we just talk games every day, clicking the like button helps us. Thank you very much. But as always, thanks for watching. We'll see you guys next time.